We saw participants coming on, so I'm just going to wait an extra minute here. All right, everyone ready? Yes, we're on mute. All right. Well, I'd like to begin today's webinar and welcome everyone to the Antimicrobial Stewardship Project webinar series created by the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy at the University of Minnesota. I'm Marty Peterson and I'm your moderator and host today. And I've got uh, two well-known and recognized experts with me today to speak about stewardship Stewardship being diagnostic stewardship and antimicrobial stewardship combined and the two of them together in action. So they're gonna bring some of their uh, world world real world case studies and experiences to help us apply these two um, stewardship activities into deliverables and, and value and quality to our, our healthcare systems. So first I have a few slides, uh, but the two speakers with us today are Dr. Robin Patel from the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. And I'll be giving a little bit more of, of a background and overview of her as we get into her slides and her beginning of her presentation. And then uh, Dr. Brandon Bookstaber will be speaking second and uh, we will give his background and introduce him as well. He's coming to us from the University of South Carolina College Pharmacy. So with that, we'll have a few slides of background regarding this is a uh, a webinar that offers CE for many different groups. So we're very excited about that. Pharmacy CE ACPE accreditation. We're offering 1.25 contact hours with this webinar, as well as uh, physician CE. They're listed nursing CE and CE for clinical laboratory professionals or PACE, part of the PACE program. And finally, for those of you that have the VCIDP certification and need some recertification, uh, post-test questions are also available at the website related to this webinar. So really encompassing uh, a very high value webinar here with continuing education. We thank our speakers for bringing this to us. For, so our target audience as mentioned, with related to our, the educational content and the continuing education that we're providing our physicians, nurses, pharmacists, and clinical laboratory professionals. We've got learning objectives to three of them that our speakers will be covering. They're going to describe real world examples of the integration of diagnostic stewardship and antimicrobial stewardship. So really focusing on that word integration today, using data to understand the impact of diagnostic stewardship on patient outcomes. And then also talking about how they implement interdisciplinary programs to avoid uh, everything being siloed. So how do they bring the team together to deliver this high value of implementing a diagnostic, integrated diagnostic and antimicrobial stewardship program. We'd like to thank our sponsor today, BioMariu, for supporting us with an educational grant to bring you these uh, very experienced speakers and providing the continuing education opportunity for all of you. And mostly just thank all of our participants for joining us today. The disclosures to review today, there's, uh, as you know, disclosures that come with providing a webinar and continuing education. Um, and these, these pertain down below bulleted all the individuals that are either speaking or were a part of the review of the content. Um, so you can see there, uh, our two speakers, uh, Dr. Bookstaber and Dr. Patel's disclosures there. Um, not going to, to read through all of them, but they are there in front of you because they are in high demand and their expertise is, is very important. Um, the rest of us, as far as the SIDRAP team and the reviewers had no conflicts of interest to report. So thank you for that. And then finally, the information that you need is uh, to go to ProCE, who is our CE provider today, to complete your post-test questions related to CE and your evaluation. Your deadline to note this down will be March 12th, so about a month from now, 
to um, provide, to answer those questions. You'll provide it in attendance code for this live webinar at the end after the Q&A session, and I'll also be providing it in the chat box for you. And finally, um, before I introduce and hand it over to Dr. Patel, we want to engage with all of those that are listening in today, and thank you so much. Please do that through the chat box, and you can send us your questions, your comments to all the, all the um, panelists, and we'll have time at the end of the session to engage with the speakers. So with that, I'll finish up here with my bit of the intro to introduce Dr. Patel. We're so lucky to have her today. She's a very busy person. Um, as the director of the Infectious Disease Research Laboratory at the Mayo Foundation and Mayo Clinic, she's a prof um, Elizabeth and Robert Allen Professor of Individualized Medicine, Professor of Medicine and Professor of Microbiology at the Mayo Clinic. You may also know her as the most recent past president of the Antimicrobial Society for Microbiology, uh, ASM, and she also uh, is just their immediate past president now serving on that board and on other committees. And um, she, we were just speaking before we launched the webinar. Um, her education came from Canada growing up in Montreal with her medical degree from McGill University. And then she went, joined the Mayo Clinic as a resident in internal medicine, then a fellow in infectious diseases, and finally a fellow in clinical microbiology. So very lucky to have you today, Dr. Patel. Thank you for joining us. And I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Marnie. It's great to be here. I love to talk about diagnostics and I can't believe that there are more than 500 people that want to hear about microbial diagnostics at the noon hour today. So thank you all for joining as well. I think we're in the middle of a big technology revolution now speared onward by COVID-19. And we have a lot of new tests and we need to figure out how to use them to really do uh, the best job we can caring for our patients. So I'm going to share with you today three strategies that we have used and uh, show you some examples around each of these areas. Uh, one of them is providing ordering guidance and developing ordering algorithms. Another is helping with results interpretation at the point of resulting. And the last is performing clinical trials to address the impact of new diagnostics and to define ideal utilization of new tests. So I can't talk about everything uh, that we've done in terms of trying to figure out which test is appropriate for which patients, uh, but I'm gonna give a couple of examples with uh, multiplex panels. And the first one is with multiplex gastrointestinal panels. These aren't brand new. They've been around for a few years. There's several of them, uh, Vergine, Luminax, Biofire, and so forth. And they look for a large number of gastrointestinal pathogens. And I think when they first came out, they generated a lot of controversy. I personally, when I saw these, I thought, well, now this is, this is really wonderful because instead of having to set up specific cultures for each of the bacteria here, run individual nucleic acid amplification tests and antigen detections, we can just do one panel and get our answer. And so I'm very excited about this kind of diagnostic, uh, even uh, given the controversy. But one of the first things that we did uh, after evaluating uh, these diagnostics and really convincing ourselves that they work and they perform as well as the other tests is to figure out how we would want to use them in our clinical practice. And to do that, we really had to look at the testing algorithm, the overall testing algorithm for acute gastroenteritis, because that's what these panels are designed to diagnose. And so we didn't look at just when would you order the multiplex panel and when would you not order it, but instead took it from a, a patient-centric perspective, you know, when would you test for acute gastroenteritis and how. And this is what we came up with now in recent guidelines. This is more or less what's out there as well. Uh, we decided that in patients who weren't terribly ill, those who had community acquired diarrhea for less than seven days without any warning signs, such as fever or bloody diarrhea, dysentery, severe abdominal pain, hospitalization, dehydration, or an immunocompromised state, they in fact needed no testing. Not, not the panel, not culture, not anything. But if diarrhea would persist for seven days or longer, or if they had any of those warning uh, findings or had traveler's diarrhea, 
Then the recommendation was to go right to the multiplex GI panel. And there's some additional testing for, for patients with certain other risk factors or if uh, symptoms persist. And conversely, of course, if they really qualify just for testing for C. diff, that you would go that way as opposed to running uh, the whole panel. So this was really important to us because it then allowed us to build into our electronic ordering systems and communicate with various groups in the institution what our infectious disease and gastroenterology and clinical microbiology colleagues felt was a most appropriate approach to acute, acute gastroenteritis. And I'll show you a second example uh, this is the meningitis encephalitis panel. Here, we really only have one on the market at this point in time. And I'll tell you, when this first came out, I had a little bit more pause than the gastrointestinal panel because it's one thing to sort of change up the diagnosis of diarrhea. It's a completely different story to think about central nervous system infections, right? The stakes are a lot higher, I, I would say. So we really asked ourselves first and foremost, you know, how, how does this panel actually perform compared to uh, what we're doing, do we think it's acceptable to even talk about implementing it into our clinical practice? And then we, we ask the question and how would we implement it? So I just wanna show you what we learned here because I, I think this is important. We looked at 291 clinical residual spinal fluid samples that had been positive uh, for uh, organisms that are on this panel, either by culture or by PCR, et cetera. And we included in this study 76 specimens that had been collected in the pre-vaccine era, that is between 1975 and 1997, which we happen to have still around because our lab has been open since 1911 and we do throw things out, but we, we still had these. And that's really important because a lot of the vaccine preventable diseases, we just don't see very often. And so it's hard to interrogate the performance of a new diagnostic for something that you don't see very often. We, we see them occasionally. And so these 76 were positive for bacterial pathogens. Again, things that we would have seen in the past, but don't see common today. Um, the overall positive percent agreement for viruses and bacteria uh, was 90 and 98% respectively. But interestingly for Cryptococcus neoformans gadii, it was 52%. Now we can't really just look at viruses and bacteria as a whole. We have to look at the details here because we're talking about patients and they don't have just a virus. They have a specific virus and what virus um, is detected really matters to uh, care of the patient. And so in the viral analysis, there's a really a bit of a fallout around herpes simplex virus, uh, both one and two. And this is really concerning because if you're trying to diagnose herpes encephalitis, right, and you miss the detection of herpes simplex virus type one, that could have adverse effects for your patient. So this was helpful to be able to see. On the bacterial and fungal side, what we saw is that for the bacteria, again, you see plenty of these organisms that we would have seen in the, in the old days, but we don't see much anymore because of vaccines. It really performed very well, even on these old, old specimens that we had in our freezers. That was pretty exciting. Not so exciting, maybe, is Cryptococcus neoformans gadii. Now, these specimens, for the most part, have been positive by antigen testing. And as you probably know, when we test for cryptococcal meningitis, it can either be for an initial diagnosis or sometimes people perform follow-up testing over time. And you know, it's been said that, well, uh, PCR type approaches aren't great for those follow-up tests. And that's true. A lot of those missed cases were the follow-up tests, but we have had uh, several patients at initial diagnosis of cryptococcal meningitis test negative with the biofire film array panel and positive with the cryptococcal antigen on spinal fluid. So that's something to really be aware of. So now having understood this assay and, and how it might perform in our practice, we did the same thing that we did with the GI panel. We came up with an ordering algorithm. I will say this was a bit more complicated. There was a lot of back and forth between neurology, infectious diseases, uh, clin micro, pediatric neurology, pediatric infectious diseases, because some of the, the CNS infections are different in adults and children. And this is what we came up with. And again, we didn't approach it uh, with the question of when should I use the panel versus not, but really how do I diagnose acute and we had to define that less than eight days of symptoms, meningitis or encephalitis. And of course it starts off with the lumbar puncture and cell count protein glucose gram stain. But you'll note that cryptococcal antigen is right up top if, if there are patient risk factors for that disease. And so we would always recommend that um, as opposed to going straight to the panel. And then because we have some in-house tests available for streptococcus pneumoniae with an antigen test, 
HSV and enterovirus PCR, we felt like going to those as opposed to the whole panel made sense. They're rapidly available and they seem to work with the consideration given to varicella zoster virus PCR. But for uh, sites that don't have access to the individual tests or with immunocompromised patients, uh, going right to the panel uh, did make a lot of sense. And then we ended up actually taking this even further down. And I'm going to show you a couple of slides very fast. They're very unclear because there's a lot of information, but we really went on to look at, okay, so if the panel is negative and you don't get an answer, uh, what do you do if you still are suspecting infection? And, and that was, a, I think, a helpful activity because we listed out then a whole number of other uh, tasks that you might consider performing. And I'm not gonna go over all of these today, but I think this exercise of really not just asking the question of when you would use the panel, but how would you use it in the context of working up a patient with a particular disease was uh, very helpful to us. So I'm gonna move on and uh, talk about uh, assessing the clinical and economic impact of new tests. Um, oftentimes this is done with pre and post intervention studies where you introduce a new test and then you look at how things are going with the new test compared to what happened before that new test was introduced. But those types of studies, although they're common, can be difficult to interpret due to non-study variations over time. And as well, when we look at new diagnostics, we do have to consider institution-specific variables, such as distinctive patient populations, local uh, resistance rates, and of course, the availability of antimicrobial stewardship programs, all of which can affect the impact of new tests. Panels, actually any test, has the greatest impact when the tests are performed and results reported on as quickly as possible and appropriately acted upon by providers. And that seems like common sense, and I'm sure all of you participating here would agree, but it can be hard to really deliver that. You know, we can say we have this great new test, but is it really gonna be used in the ideal way? And antibiotic de-escalation, we've learned in our studies, and I'm going to show you some data on that, is ideally accomplished in the context of delivery of results by an expert in antimicrobial stewardship, such as an ID pharmacist or an ID physician or a doctoral level clinical microbiologist. So I'm going to show you a couple of examples of where we looked at testing of positive blood culture bottles with some of the novel diagnostics that are out there. The first one is going to be a rapid nucleic acid amplification panel, and the second one is going to be rapid phenotypic susceptibility testing. So when these come out, we always ask ourselves, well, should we bring them in? Will they make a difference? They're by and large add-on tests. And they're really not orderable because if you're going to do them quickly, you just have to operationalize them in the laboratory. There are lots of molecular tests now that are out there for testing positive blood culture uh, bottles. We have panels from BioFire Film Array, Veragene, Genmark, and there are others as well. And the composition differs a little bit um, and the way they're deployed differs a little bit. I'm not gonna get into great detail. I will mention that there have been upgrades over time and um, so the, for example, the Filmary BCID2 has more markers on it than the original BCID did. And we have some panels like the Genmark panel that has some interesting ways of approaching identification too, alongside having specific organisms on panel. Uh, there can be a pan, gram-negative pan uh, yeast uh, type of panels on there as well. On the fungal side, um, you know, we started off with pretty simple panels, but they've really expanded a lot to not just have common yeast, but even uh, some mycelial organisms as well. And on the resistance gene side, uh, that too has expanded over time. Uh, though I think there's no resistance panel that's really complete for a prediction of all resistance or susceptibility. So back to the film array um, blood culture identification panel, we uh, a long time ago, several years ago, when this first came out, asked ourselves, well, should we offer this in our clinical practice or not? And how would we uh, determine that? We looked at it. It performs very well analytically in the lab. There's, there's pretty much no question. I mean, we can talk about occasional issues where you get contaminants and so forth. But for the most part, it performs uh, fairly well. It's easy to do, but it is work for us. Uh, in the laboratory to really offer this. We have to offer it 24 seven. And uh, it's not inexpensive to offer this kind of testing. You need to have the instrumentation and you need to buy the kits and, and offer them. And so we really ask the question, is this worthwhile? This is the 
portfolio of the original BioFire BCID panel. The one I showed you just a minute ago is the BCID2, so the upgraded uh, panel. There were fewer markers on this panel, but this is the one we evaluated in the study I'm going to share with you here. And so to really answer that question, is this clinically useful? Does it make a meaningful change to our patients? We chose to execute a randomized controlled clinical trial. This was back in 2013, 2014, seems like a long time ago now. And we randomized our patients to a control group where they got standard of care treatment, another group where they got the rapid test alone, and then a third group where they got the rapid test with real time stewardship. So we called uh, the stewardship team with the results, they looked at the medical record, and if they thought a change was needed, either escalation or de-escalation, they called the service in turn and made that recommendation. So we're really looking at the value of stewardship there. We looked at clinical outcomes and we did not see any difference in length of stay, 30-day mortality, 30-day readmission with the same organism, toxicity, adverse drug reactions, blood culture clearance, or acquisition of drug-resistant organisms. But where we did see a difference was in the use of antibiotics. And I, I think this is uh, important. So this slide shows the three groups that control the rapid test and the rapid test plus stewardship, and then a timeline here. And what you see is identification in this red ID. So you see that's obviously faster uh, with uh, the film array BCID. And then you see um, standard susceptibility testing out here at 48 hours. And then the E with the triangle is escalation of antibiotics where appropriate. And the upside down triangle with a D is de-escalation. So what we saw is that with or without stewardship, the rapid test led to faster escalation of antibiotics, but de-escalation only happened more quickly in the context of both the rapid test along with real-time antimicrobial stewardship. So our findings were that there was more judicious antibiotic use without worsening clinical outcomes. And I do think that's important. Increased narrow spectrum antibiotics for gram positives, decreased use of piperacillin and tazobactam, decreased treatment of contaminants. And I'll show you how I think we accomplished that in a minute. And faster de-escalation and escalation with the fastest de-escalation being the group that got the rapid test plus stewardship. Now, we didn't just report what came out of the instrument. We translated it in our report, and we continue to do so today. This is actually a translation of the BCID2. I thought that would be more appropriate to show you here. So we report, for example, if we see this portfolio of results, Staph aureus complex, MECA detected, um, methicillin, oxacillin resistant Staph aureus, MRSA is predictably resistant to beta-lactams, except to terolene vancomycin or other anti-MRSA treatment recommended for initial therapy pending susceptibility results. And we advise a, an ID consult for all patients with Staph aureus bacteremia, whether uh, MRSA or MSSA. And then for Staph epi and some other findings as well, we put a probable contaminant um, comment on our reports as well. And I think this type of interpretation can help people feel comfortable not necessarily having to give antibiotics in the face of any finding. But one of the sort of weak points of that study is that the BCID panel that we evaluated only had one gram negative resistance marker on it, KPC. We really didn't see um, so much of a difference on the gram negative side. And we felt like we needed more information about antibiotic susceptibility to really impact use of antibiotics in gram negative bacteremia. So then we executed a second clinical trial. This is with the Accelerate Pheno platform, which is a rapid phenotypic susceptibility platform right out of positive blood culture bottles. And we used it just for gram negative bacteria. It can be used for gram positives as well, but this study was that. We did, um, we hypothesized that rapid phenotypic susceptibility would enable optimal management of patients with gram negative bacteremia. So we executed a prospective randomized controlled trial. This was at two US sites, uh, Mayo Clinic and UCLA, to evaluate antibiotic use and outcomes among patients with gram negative bacteremia who had uh, blood culture evaluation using standard methods or this rapid infectious, uh, rapid identification and susceptibility. And we were using rapid MALDI in uh, both arms as part of this study. So they really had a lot uh, going on. We also, based on the prior results I showed you, uh, put real-time antibiotic stewardship into both arms because we didn't want to be evaluating whether that was valuable anymore. We had learned our lesson with the prior study. This is a lot of information. Uh, we started off by screening 1,545 subjects with uh, gram-negative bacilli possibly in their blood culture, and we ended up with 226 in the modified intention to treat analysis receiving standard of care and 222 receiving the Accelerate Pheno test. 
and they were randomized again, just like they were in the BCID study. So our primary outcome was time to first antibiotic change based on what we had learned in the BCID study. And then we looked at secondary outcomes that are listed here and that I'm going to show you in just a minute. So what we found on the secondary outcomes, the clinical outcomes was just like the BCID study, we didn't see any difference in 30 day mortality, length of stay, readmission, uh, staying in the ICU 72 hours after randomization, acquiring C. diff or acquiring other multi-drug resistant organisms, which is both good and bad, right? The rapid test didn't cause any harm, but it didn't give us any benefit either. So this is, this is good to know, uh, but we did see changes in antibiotic utilization. So here I'm going to show you some more sort of subtle um, uh, data. This is a graph that shows in blue the rapid test, so the accelerate pheno results, and in red, standard culture and susceptibility. And you see time to antibiotic change, and you can see based on just looking at the graph, or you can do the statistics and see that uh, the rapid test led to faster antibiotic changes. But when we look specifically at gram-negative antibiotics, you see more of a differential. Uh, of course, we were using this on gram-negative, so that makes sense uh, in, in use of antibiotics or time to antibiotic change. Uh, with the rapid uh, identification system. But here's where it got really interesting. Uh, we looked at escalation and de-escalation. So escalation is on the left-hand side and de-escalation is on the right-hand side. And we split the groups into those that had a resistant organism and those that had a susceptible organism. And we really saw the difference with those that had a resistant organism on the time to escalation and in those that had a susceptible organism on the time to de-escalation, which kind of makes sense if you uh, think about it. Um, and this is the, the actual data. So on the left-hand side, we had 76 drug-resistant organisms. And if you're wondering what they were, they're defined on the bottom of this slide. Um, and what we saw was in the drug-resistant organism uh, group, we saw much faster escalation in the group that got the rapid phenotypic susceptibility testing and in the group that conversely, which was the majority of our population had drug susceptible organisms, this type of testing enabled de-escalation much more quickly. Again, we had real-time antimicrobial stewardship in both groups. So our conclusions from the rapid GN study, somehow I got two GNs on there, but um, anyway, that, that's the name of this study, which was published in Clinical Infectious Diseases just last year, is that rapid phenotypic susceptibility testing implemented with antimicrobial stewardship can optimize treatment of gram-negative bloodstream infections. Antibiotic modifications occurred faster with rapid testing than with standard of care, uh, Gram-negative antibiotic changes occurred a median of 24 hours faster, and in the case of drug-resistant organisms, antibiotic escalations occurred 43 hours faster. This study was limited by a low rate of multidrug-resistant gram-negative bacilli and might perform differently in different patient populations. So to summarize, I've gone over uh, how I think we should try to approach ordering guidance by developing these ordering algorithms and then building the algorithms into our ordering systems. Results interpretation, I showed you some examples with the BCID2. We really do this with all of our tests. We try to put comments in there that will inform clinicians about how we would interpret the result, not just like what gene was detected, but what it really means. And then I think we need clinical trials to address the impact of new diagnostic tests, like I showed you with the BCID and the Rapids GN study, and to define the ideal utilization of new tests. So I'm gonna end there. I don't know, Marnie, if we're taking questions now or if we're waiting till the end. We are going to wait till the end. We're gonna let Dr. Brooks Daver go next with his presentation, but that's a perfect um, reminder to all our, our participants. Um, and for those of you that are, are watching right now, there's almost 600 of you. So that's very exciting to have you all taking your time today to join us. And um, this is your opportunity to engage with Dr. Patel on her very uh, cutting edge um, you know, these impact studies are so critical to implementing diagnostics. So please uh, put your information and questions out to her uh, as, as um, we go forward. So for the Q&A will be the, about the last, um, we, actually the webinar is gonna go 15 minutes past the top of the hour. So we'll have plenty of time for Q&A. So please, please put those comments into that chat box for us. So with that, uh, Dr. Patel, thank you, and we'll come back to you. So we're gonna we're going to introduce. I'm going to introduce Dr. Bookstaver.
So if you'd like to, to drop off your video and uh, Dr. Bookstaver come on uh, your audio live with me. Um, just a, a brief introduction here for part two of this. We're in part two of the whole webinar series, uh, but this is part two of this particular webinar. So Dr. Bookstaver is gonna take us deeper into the integration of diagnostic and antimicrobial stewardship, his experience at, at PRISM Health. His background is he's an associate professor and director of the residency and fellowship training program in the Department of Clinical Pharmacy and Outcome Sciences in, at the College of Pharmacy at the uh, Uni University of South Carolina. He maintains a practice site in infectious diseases at Prism Health in Richland, where he serves as a director of the infectious diseases, PGY2 residency and clinical fellowship programs. And he also serves as co-director of the Penicillin Allergy Assessment and Skin Testing National Cert Certificate Program. So um, that's also very exciting and a very important component of, of his clinical and antimicrobial stewardship position. He's received his doctor of pharmacy degree from the University of South Carolina. And he also completed pharmacy residency and infectious diseases residency training at Wake Forest University. So with that, Dr. Uh, Bookstaver, welcome to the webinar, and we look forward to uh, your presentation. Thank you, Marnie. I really appreciate it. And welcome, everybody. Uh, it's exciting uh, to get to follow Dr. Patel as well, but I, I just want to thank uh, the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy at, at University of Minnesota. we got a lot of folks, ProCE, SIDP, uh, BO Maryu for your support, and I uh, appreciate everyone tuning in. So we're gonna take a, a dive into our experience uh, related to this integration of antimicrobial stewardship with diagnostic stewardship and hopefully share a, a couple of things that we have learned from. Um, and uh, we actually have, I'm taking it from a high level of five different things that I think are, are valuable. So you'll see those numbered as we go through uh, several of these slides orient you to our program and our hospital system. So this is Prisma Health Midlands. It used to be known as Palmetto Health. So we've recently gone through a name change with a merger with another health system in the upstate of South Carolina. So it's now the largest nonprofit health system in, in the state. I'm based in Columbia, South Carolina, so the center of the state. We have five hospitals, uh, including a dedicated children's hospital, which does have its own active stewardship program. A lot of outpatient practices and orthopedic clinics that are part of our, our group as well. Our, I'll call it our flagship hospital. It's a community teaching hospital. It is affiliated with the University of South Carolina. 650 inpatient beds. Uh, we have a formal ID consult service that sees patients at these individual hospitals with an ID medical fellowship training program as well as a pharmacy training program. We are an IDSA center of excellence for our stewardship team. And, and I'm going to come back to the name antimicrobial stewardship and support team because there was an intention there of why we actually named it that. And then just to give you a little uh, framework for what we're gonna be talking about, our electronic health record is Cerner, which we have been on. I've been there almost 15 years now. We've been on that, uh, that same platform for as long as you know I, I've known and before that. However, in the next uh, 20 days, we will be on a new uh, platform. Uh, we're converting over to Epic. Uh, so uh, some of these that I share will come from our Cerner days. We have a clinical decision support system, uh, the software of Theradoc that we have used to overlay to build a lot of our stewardship alerts. We have a number, we're very fortunate to have a number of rapid diagnostic tools available. Uh, really for the past seven plus years, we've had a number of these available. Um, our BioFire film array panels, uh, primarily in that multiplex PCR spectrum, uh, and, and I've put some of the ordering comments to the right there. It's not something I'm going to spend a lot of time on. Our focus is primarily going to be on BCID today when we're talking about our outcomes. But I will share with you very briefly uh, our new, newest uh, member to the team here of the pneumonia panel, the lower respiratory tract panel, uh, and a little bit on our GI panel um, as we, we navigate some of the things that I feel like are important from an integration standpoint. So I told you we're gonna walk through five different things and, and kind of start at a, at a high level that isn't gonna take a lot of data to support these first two things, but more of just an anecdotal experience and sharing what we do as a, as a program. So number one here, I think it's very important for stewardship to have an active decision-making uh, role 
and responsibility in new rapid diagnostic technology that is added into your health system. You, you really need to be part of that decision making. And so where does this stem from? Uh, this is a, a paper we were involved in. Uh, Rachel Foster, who's the first author here, is actually Monica Mahoney's brainchild, but this was published in Itchy a few years ago. And we surveyed pharmacists who were involved in stewardship across the country and, and just try to gauge their level of knowledge and how often they're utilizing these rapid diagnostic technologies. Because as Dr. Patel alluded to, there's a lot. There's a lot to know and uh, new technologies are coming out very frequently. And what, what we found is that about 30% uh, were not comfortable with these new rapid diagnostic technologies, meaning MALDI-TOF, multiplex PCRs, uh, et cetera. And it was, it was quite eye-opening uh, that, that many were just uncomfortable. And, and so a third, a third being uncomfortable is, is, I think, a significant number there. And actually, multiplex PCR, which we're talking quite a bit about today, of all the technologies evaluated, there was the lowest familiarity reported among these uh, stewardship pharmacists who responded to this. So, so what do we do? Um, well, like most of you that are involved in stewardship of your institutions, we do have an interprofessional stewardship team. Uh, this includes microbiology, which is certainly important, but we actually review newly available or pending approval rapid diagnostic technologies. And we do this in a process, for those who are familiar with it, very analogous to a traditional drug monograph review for a pharmacy and therapeutics committee. So there'll be a, a review of the new technology. We will meet, um, maybe maybe uh, if we can bring our own lunch uh, still, we'll do that and get together. But we'll meet and we'll discuss the merits of, of this technology before implementing it um, and before purchasing it. Uh, and, and I think that's a really important part of, of how we're able to, to do these well. Uh, when they're fully implemented. We meet weekly as a, as a core stewardship team, and we are very consistent with that. Dr. Alison, our ID physician who's in charge of our program, is, is very consistent with that. And then we have additional monthly full stewardship meetings, which includes microbiology, where this may be presented at one of those meetings. Um, and then we're, we're now adding our outpatient stewardship meetings as well. So we feel like this is an important solution to make sure that your rapid diagnostics are um, are chosen appropriately, especially when there is significant costs that could be associated with them, and that everyone is in agreement of how they will be launched. Now, in that same vein, uh, in that same vein, you've now decided that you want to have this technology, um, but there's a validation phase or a beta testing phase, however you want to uh, term it, uh, of the new technology, and stewardship has to be active in this. I'm not going to show you a lot of data for the purposes of not disclosing some of our validation phase, but if somebody has questions about it offline, I'm, I'm certainly uh, welcome to talk with you offline. But this newest player to our group, the lower respiratory tract panel, for example, when we went through this validation phase, it was very interesting to meet um, with our um, a, a nurse who was in our microbiology division, uh, was really accruing these data. And we were able to walk through as samples were requested and have an open channel there to help facilitate even some samples that would be part of this validation phase. So it was very, very valuable. Um, and, and it was simply walking through a really well-articulated Excel file that we would do at one of these meetings, but get updated at each meeting so that we understood what was happening, what were the concerns, how would we hypothetically apply this? Because what it did was it allowed for greater confidence in the technology we could establish criteria based not only on other data and conversations with folks who have used it, but, but our own validation data. And then really shorten the timeline to effective launch. Now, there are some other things that help. You know, you may start to understand and ask questions about reimbursement, third-party billing. It educates you. While that might not go into your day-to-day -day discussions, it certainly does educate you um, when you're making decisions and understanding where administration may come in and ask you questions of your stewardship program you're now a little bit more educated, even on other areas that you may not, you may not think about on a day-to-day -day basis, such as reimbursement for these particular technologies. Now, number three, and I'm gonna spend a lot of concentrated time on this, and, and this is really leveraging the technology for early and meaningful antibiotic de-escalation. And while I know most of you would say that you, you probably have this slide somewhere in your, your slide deck as well, I just wanna make sure that we're, we're all on the same page here. When you think about conventional micro methods and when we're receiving the data that we receive, it's gonna take a day to two for identification, three days for susceptibilities, and ultimately to streamline therapy, maybe that's day three, 
um, or even longer, especially in de-escalation, because you, especially in a teaching environment, you may need more time to contemplate results with the, the team, the primary team. And so in the era of short course therapy really being pushed, you know, maybe as short as five to seven days in, in some of these infections, is really de-escalation through conventional methods as impactful. If you think about the data out there of some of these quote unquote adverse events that we may have from overuse or even maybe appropriate, but empirical use, broad spectrum use, nephrotoxicity at days three or four with the combination of vancomycin, propylcel, and tazobactam, C. difficile infections on average about five days with broad spectrum antibiotics sooner in some high risk patients, and antimicrobial resistance as short as 48 hours. So can we move the timeline enough to really impact some of those data points? Now, Dr. Patel reviewed this already. I'm not going to go back through this. Uh, film array is the BCID, and this is really BCID1 uh, as opposed to BCID2, but it does have 27 targets, including three resistant strains, uh, and results are rapid you know, within two hours of a gram stain report because it is done once the gram stain is reported positive. Now, BCID1, these are the, the, the pathogens and the resistance mechanisms that are, are shown here. And now BCID2 is, is coming. There'll be a few new ones. And, and I, uh, those of you who had experience with that, um, it, is, it is fun. We, we played this game, you know, where the, it's a gram negative rod, uh, gram stain, but then the BCID is negative. And so you're playing that guessing game. Well, the BCID2, BCID2 is gonna fill in some of those gaps for you because it's gonna add Sinotrophomonas multifilia. It's gonna add Salmonella. Uh, it's going to add Klebsiella erogenes if you're still uh, holding on to the former name, Enterobacter erogenes. So you, you maybe won't have as much fun there, but it, certainly an advancement. Um, but everything we're going to talk about is related to BCID1. Now, I could have picked a number of number of slides here to show you. I, I picked one from Sean McVeigh here because he's from our state in South Carolina at the time uh, at MUSC. And this is just demonstrating what happens um, when you add a BCID to a really established stewardship team. And so um, I'll orient you a little bit here, but um, this is the BCID line uh, at the top here. This is stewardship program that's been established. And then this is your control arm at the, at the bottom here. And the first thing to note is organization, organism identification went from 57 hours to 17 hours, which makes sense. Effective therapy went from 13 or 15 hours with stewardship or the control arm down to five hours, which also makes sense. But then you see this de-escalation moving from around 60 hours down to about 48 hours. So is there a way we can move that even further? Uh, and this is certainly a great early study for, for folks to build off and knowing that even rapid diagnostics for the best functioning stewardship teams add quite a bit. So what did we do at our institution? Well, we in, implemented what we call the stewardship bundle. And what's, what's part of a bundle? Well, for us, a couple of things. One is education, education in the masses, but also education to the individual. Um, we had a really nice rapid diagnostic walkthrough where we demonstrated results of the, of the BCID and MAL DTOF at the time and what that really meant. Um, we, we had a established stewardship program that conducted pro, prospective audit feedback with our FairDoc and alert system set up. We also had some uh, prior authorization set up where we, what we call it is that we have pre-approved indications. Uh, most of those are on the gram positive side, but we, we certainly did have some on the, on the gram negative side. We established bloodstream infection guidelines. So this was both empirical guidelines but also de-escalation guidelines. And I'm gonna come back to that because I feel like that's something a little bit unique uh, that we did to help with, with the data that I'm gonna show you. We also were part of what's a, a Spectrum app. Some of you um, have maybe heard of this, your institutions may use it, but it's, it's called Spectrum, not the cable company, internet company Spectrum, but it's a, a different Spectrum. And this would allow us a, for users within our institution to download this app um, and be able to access some of these uh, information tools, such as the de-escalation guideline uh, for their use uh, that were based on, on local data. And then we also implemented restriction uh, resistance prediction tools. And I'll um, talk a little bit more about our ESBL tool in a moment. So what you're looking at here is the results of this implementation of this cumulative bundle. On the Y, on the y axis, you have the proportion of patients who remained on anti-pseudomonal beta-lactams. That's what that APBL is. And you're looking at a data set of about 1,200 
uh, bloodstream infections due to enterobacterialis. The x-axis down here is time from blood culture, from collection of blood, blood culture. And the arrows I have drawn in here are the median time to de-escalation off of these anti-pseudomonals. So in our pre-intervention phase, this was prior to really this full bundle and any rapid diagnostics, it was around four days for the median de-escalation time, which is pretty standard. Uh, in our phase one, we rolled in Maldi-Toff and were able to shrink that down uh, slightly under three days, really most occurring on three days. And then further with BCID, we shrunk that to two days. Um, and that was certainly before susceptibilities returned. And this is gram negative de-escalation. Uh, so this doesn't just say, oh, we de-escalated vancomycin. No, this is de-escalation from our anti-pseudomonal beta-lactams to something a little more targeted. So I do, want to, I do want to speak on maybe a little bit of why we were able to do that. Now, Dr. Patel already put this slide up here. I'm, I'm using it for a similar purpose, but I want to highlight something um, for you that it should make sense to you. Um, as she pointed out with, with their randomized controlled trial, when they just had PCR technology, um, folks knew to escalate once they get data back. So you didn't really need a expert to tell you, hey, Pseudomonas is on the PCR, you need an anti pseudomonal beta-lactam, or a gram negative is on the PCR, you're not covering it, you need it. You, you didn't need that. But what you needed was stewardship on the ground helping to facilitate de-escalation. And I think that's what's so valuable, and I love this randomized control trial for, for demonstrating that, something that we talk about quite a bit. Now, this is back to our bloodstream infection de-escalation. How did we accomplish this? What you're looking at is a screenshot of our de-escalation guide for gram-negative bloodstream infections. And what we, what we attempted to do here is across the top panel is walk folks through the timeline. Okay, a blood culture is obtained. We receive a gram stain. Your BCID results will come back if it's a positive gram stain. You may get MALDI back as a confirmation or additional test if necessary. And then you'll ultimately get in vitro susceptibility testing back. And so we wanted folks to feel comfortable based on our local data and tools that they could de-escalate early if necessary and not have to automatically wait to for susceptibilities to come back. So as one example here, um, if it was uh, an E. coli um, and the patient was on you know, empiric piperacillin tazobactam or cefepime, and BCID identified E. coli as present, um, based on patient factors, uh, we offered the opportunity and suggested the opportunity to de-escalate to ceftriaxone. Now, we are in a population where our ESBL rate is 10 to 12 percent, so not the same as other places, but that type of percent allowed us to develop ESBL prediction scores uh, that were highly sensitive uh, and were validated in a number of different populations. So we felt very comfortable in that regard to be able to de-escalate early. And, and it really gave confidence to our steward extenders so that it wasn't always just us doing this uh, from ID or stewardship perspective. We were able to move the dial there. Uh, we focus a lot of our attention on streamlining and gram-negative bloodstream infections with our group. And so we also put in our oral uh, transitions of care options as well. Uh, whether it be for quinolones or trim sulfa, uh, et cetera, is our preferred option. So this was um, this has been very important for us. Um, getting it into an app-based form was also very valuable for us in, in order to reach folks real time because it's so interesting. Even over the last the last seven to eight years, you know, you, you move from and certainly in the fifteen years almost that I've been here, you move from paper-based to uh, you have a, a nice guidebook where it's all compiled. You put it all electronic, you build it into an EHR, uh, and then you also have an app. So it, it's just, it's very, been very interesting. And you have to be adaptable to that um, because if you don't, you'll fall behind and you'll lose your, your providers a little bit there. Um, but it also helps establish a culture of de-escalation. And I think that we get good buy-in from our, our steward extenders because of that. Now thinking about, um, well, Brandon, you just showed you're de-escalating all those anti-sminal beta-lactams early. Are you hurting patients? And Dr. Rattel mentioned this. You, wanna, you don't want to uh, change antibiotics too early where you're going to cause harm. And so we were very pleased with, with these results. So what you're looking at is the percentage of patients uh, who had appropriate empirical therapy based on susceptibility results when they came back, despite 
escalation, or excuse me, despite de-escalation. So the red represents the critically ill patients, the blue represents overall. And so in the pre-intervention arm, we were actually only correct 89% of the time, uh, which escalated to 97% in our, our patients who need it most, we feel, you know, critically ill, you can't, can't be wrong as often. Uh, versus 91% to 95% overall. And so this was very encouraging that despite significant reductions in APBL use, we were able to still maintain good adequate therapy uh, or appropriate therapy at the time susceptibilities came back. Now, the, one of the things that we were very curious about is when we're using these rapid diagnostic results, sometimes we would integrate uh, new, new interventions that really would probably be more seen as antimicrobial specific versus syndrome specific. And this has talked a lot about folks that study antimicrobial stewardship and, and learn this from the ground up is uh, it's probably recommended for syndrome specific, but certainly I think many of us have always, there's been something that's been a pull or a tug at antimicrobial specific interventions. So this was a, a look, uh, a study, Krutika Metawala published this when she worked with our group. She's now down at MUSC, but this was taking our stewardship interventions, education guidelines, and rapid diagnostics, and looking at the four different interventions that we had over a specific timeline and how those impacted our anti-sumonal beta-lactam based on days of therapy per thousand patient days. So we had a carbapenem specific prospective audit feedback. We had a PIP-TASO one, uh, but then we really had these syndrome specific ones like a BSI that I've already referenced and also an intra-abdominal infection one as well, where we saw tremendous use uh, empirically of anti sumonal beta-lactams that, that honestly would continue for most of the duration. So what we found, just to cut to the chase for the sake of time, is prospective audit feedback of when you're doing an antimicrobial specific, it just was really literally squeezing the balloon. Patients would move from a carbapenem to cefepime, or they'd move from pitazo to cefepime or, or back and forth. And, and while that may be advantageous for a particular patient, um, it, it certainly wasn't moving the dial on total use. And so it's another thing that we found is so important is how you measure your metrics really can tell the story either correctly or, or, or incorrectly at your institution. But we certainly found an impact with our syndrome specific interventions um, that was very encouraging uh, because of so much time and effort spent in those particular areas. Now, what about number four? You know, de-escalation and, and focusing on bloodstream infections, I will tell you, we do that so much because we feel there's a lot of clinical bang for your buck there. You know, those patients have high, high chance of morbidity, mortality, uh, that are hospitalized with gram leg of bloodstream infections. So we do spend a lot of our, our time and attention there, but you have to make sure that if you're using a lot of these rapid diagnostics and you want more of them um, and you want to show an impact to microbiology, um, your laboratory folks, administration, uh, you really want some of these initiatives to line up with quality and other patient care initiatives that are going on in your department or in your hospital overall. And so one of those is certainly C. difficile infection. Um, we had a member of our team, our stewardship team, one of our ID pharmacists, Julie Justo, who was a member of this quality group at, who was working on C. difficile infections specifically. And this is always on the radar for, for essentially every institution. And so what we tried to demonstrate was, do our rapid diagnostics really help reduce C. difficile infections, specifically hospital onset, which is such an important metric for our stewardship folks. And this is one of those shared metrics. You know, it's a shared metric for stewardship, infection control, uh, and others. So this was important. Uh, this was Megan Seddon, one of our, our former uh, residents in our program who's down at Sarasota now. And this was looking at um, about 800 patients across um, a several year period, looking at the impact of early de-escalation from anti-pseudomodal beta-lactams in gram-negative bloodstream infections. So what you're looking at on the x-axis is days following bloodstream infection, and the y-axis is the proportion of patients who develop C. diff. Well, overall, 4.4% of patients develop C. diff, which is kind of right in line with um, what you would expect for gram-negative bloodstream infections that are in a sick population. But in those who continued anti-seminal beta-lactams for greater than 48 hours, it was 7% compared to 1.8% in those who were able to de-escalate or never had to use anti-seminal beta-lactams 
uh, at that point. So you saw an, an approximate threefold reduction in C. difficile rates. Now, the, to Dr. Patel's point earlier, we use propensity scoring um, as in our regression analysis, but there's still opportunity for confounders here, and we recognize that. But it was sit, certainly still a very encouraging message to us that, hey, early de-escalation can also help on this metric as well. And one of my favorite graphs to show when we're, when we're talking to, to administration or others is, okay, what if we overlay this reduction in antibiotic utilization and hospital onset C. diff? And I'm not talking causality here. I just want you to look at the numbers, which is, which is very uh, intriguing. Uh, so what you're looking at, the, the x-axis is about a three and a half year period on the bottom and the y-axis in the red. These are anti-seminal beta-lactam use days of therapy per thousand patient days. And the blue is hospital onset C. diff cases per 100,000 patient days. And you can see a really nice decline there. Were there other things happening? Sure, there are other things happening. But it really is neat that it was about a 25% decrease in our anti-pseudomonal beta-lactam use simultaneously with about a 30% decrease in hospital onset C. diff. So um, it, there, this was not perfect, right? I mean, you'd really need a randomized controlled trial on de-escalation uh, to show that uh, as, as a much better causality and linkage. Uh, but it certainly hits home for us knowing in your own institution what else is going on and how this is making a specific impact. Now our stewardship team will follow uh, and be alerted to every C. difficile positive case for intervention, but also for failure mode analysis. We actually walk back through all of the cases to see if there was a missed stewardship opportunity and report that to this quality team. And then the, the last part of this is our GI multiplex panel. This is one of the few rapid diagnostics that was unrestricted at launch. Um, and this is where I would say a counter to that number one and number two I put up at the very beginning where you want to be involved in those early decisions. We probably weren't quite as involved in this decision uh, of when and how to roll this out. So it kind of just rolled out. Um, and over a 36 month period, um, we evaluated about 440 GI panels that were conducted. And based on criteria that was established or proposed by that quality team, 60% of those were deemed inappropriate. This could have been because of duplicate C. diff PCRs or that was the intent and they ran the GI PCR anyway, uh, concurrent laxative use, et cetera, other things that, that are often applied to C. difficile testing. But I will tell you, it's very important because remember the GI panel does have C. diff um, on it. And so there, there are ramifications for, for those results as well. So this was very uh, helpful to our quality committee in order to implement these and then be able to establish the baseline to see a change. And then lastly, number five, and, and this is where you've got to establish the baseline to, to show value, um, not only in yourselves, um, but um, return on investment for rapid diagnostics. And I'll tell you, so I trained at Wake Forest, as Marnie mentioned, um, where they had a very established stewardship program when I was there in, in 2004, five and six. And it was, um, it was very uh, important for me to learn that no matter how long your stewardship team is there, you need to show value and you need to, to show not only the value and sustainability, but if you were to go away, what would that mean? And so I think rapid diagnostics are, are no different. In that same survey that I alluded to at the very beginning, uh, we also asked pharmacists how they were, stewardship pharmacists, how they were evaluating the impact of rapid diagnostics at their institutions and only 32% had done any type of assessment of rapid diagnostics. Most common was on de-escalation or Im impact on early empirical therapy, which makes sense. Uh, and then less common were things related to cost and the clinical outcomes like length of stay and mortality. So I'd encourage people who are getting engaged in this. There are a lot of stewardship related resources out there. Um, SIDP has a research mini series they just came out with. Uh, there was a publication, Tom Dilworth led this, uh, and Courtney Pagels in Journal of Am uh, the American College of Clinical Pharmacy on just thinking through stewardship research. So I'd encourage you to, uh, to take a look at that and, and see if this is something that you really can embark on, even if it's just for your own local institution. It certainly improved our relations with microbiology department. It was we were able to then have really strong, sound data to showcase to our internal leadership and to external stakeholders as well. 
uh, this was quite valuable um, and, and certainly has been impactful for us in getting more rapid diagnostics uh, and additional resources, even personnel resources. So a couple of quick summary points. Uh, I, would, uh, I would consider a PNT like structure, uh, a drug monograph like structure for evaluating potential RDTs. It's very educational. Uh, I, I mean, some of these technologies are, are very, um, they're very rapidly changing, but they're, the, learning the technology is, is important. Uh, and that might, uh, maybe in the era of COVID, we have seen some of that uh, and, and it might inspire us to do even more uh, related to some of these other non-COVID RDTs. They do have tremendous return on investment and they certainly can improve patient care involving stewards and steward extenders. Uh, it doesn't have to just be you. And implement and assess. You really can show that return on investment to demonstrate value going forward. I wanna thank our team. Uh, this really, this whole slide deck is a team effort um, and, and all the data here that come from our day-to-day uh, -day activities are a team effort. Uh, and, and so not only our stewardship and support team, we name it that because uh, the education is so important and the support that we have from others is, is so valuable because we really see ourselves as a team with our microbiology colleagues and our steward extenders. If you have any interest, we do have a public access portal to that stewardship uh, website that would have some of those tools on it uh, that I mentioned. So with that, I thank you very much. I'll turn it back over to you, Marnie. Great, thank you so much, Brandon. I really appreciate that. Really talking about the value, assessing value of the of the rapid diagnostics test and as you implement them. And Dr. Patel's come come back on as well. And I believe Dr. Patel, you've you've been tracking some of the questions that have been coming through. Um, so we're going to begin the the Q and A session. And then just to remind everyone, there is an attendance code. So um, Thank you, yes. And um, I'm just monitoring some of the chat questions coming in, but I've got an attendance code that I'm gonna post into the chat box here, but also we will um, advance the slide to provide that at the end of the uh, Q&A. Um, and I have some acknowledgements at the end too, to, to thank all of our program planning committee as well. Brandon, I just wanted to ask you, uh, you mentioned your your stewardship extenders and and, and could you just provide just, you know, generally who, who those individuals are again for those, so people understand the, your, your team? Absolutely, great question. We, we meet once a month as a full team and our, our goal was to have representation from anyone who was interested, that's number one. We, we didn't have an exclusive list of who, we, we sent out a blanket invite. Hey, if you wanna be part of our stewardship large group, we're welcome to have you, we want people interested. But then we had targeted invitations to to groups that, that see a lot of our patients, you know, our cardiovascular team, cardio, uh, cardiothoracic team, our orthopedics team, emergency department, uh, our ICUs. And so we, it, it, the list goes on, but we invited both pharmacists and physicians to be part of this. We also have nursing representation and we have quality representation. And so we see each of those pharmacists and physicians as our steward extenders uh, on the floor because we certainly can't cover every single patient uh, and, and want them to be active in that role. And, and they've been very engaged with our meetings, which has been encouraging. Great, thank you. And then um, Dr. Bookstaver, I'll just ask you to stop sharing the screen for just a, a, you know the next 10 minutes here as we, as we do Q and A, and then um, up, we'll come back live for that uh, attendance code. Um, and Dr. Patel, is that similar to your, uh, the overall structure for assessing a, a new rapid diagnostic technology? Do you, do you bring together a committee? Because it looks like you've got components of va validation in the laboratory, just some of the standardized tests for, for that type of clinical, from the clinical microbiology perspective for rollout. And then of course, you've got to assess on the clinical side as well. Is, yeah, is we, have a, we have a, a similar system. I, I don't think uh, that operationally everything's identical, and I, I don't know that there's a standard in the field, but I will comment that we are seeing really rapidly evolving technology, and I think the analogy to COVID-19 diagnostics is great. Um, I mean, in our field, there are literally new diagnostics that are coming out like every week, right? And uh, to have a group review, all of them might be um, 
a rather big ask. I think that it, it is analogous to drugs in some ways, but in some ways, diagnostics are moving a lot faster than therapeutics. And, and so you need some sort of filtering, I think. You, you need to make sure you're sampling you know, everything that might be of interest to your institution. That's, that's hard to do, right? How do you know that you've, you've seen all the things that might help you? And then you need to have a way to sort of sort them uh, into, I'd say yes, no, or maybe, right? And, and then on the yes and maybes, I think you do want to have a vetting process with, with your team, your institutional team. And I think that's what Brandon is talking about. Uh, but there, there are also pieces like fit into the laboratory. So for example, if you have an instrument that's running 20 different tests on it, and now the vendor has a new test, uh, it, it's going to be a lot easier for your institution to, to take that vendor's test and bring it in rather than bringing in a whole new platform to run the test on a different platform, right? So there, there are some logistical uh, considerations as well, we're seeing in a nice analogy, again, with COVID-19, a lot moved outside of the laboratory, right? So, so what we talked about here today is mostly in laboratory testing, but we are seeing tests move out of the lab to point of care, uh, to clinics, probably to pharmacies, to homes and so forth. And that introduces a lot of other questions about, you know, how to get it right because we're really here to do the right thing for our patients at the end of the day. So I think really thinking about this, um, I would say engaging, bringing people together, however that's done. I, I like the way of, of sending open invitations. It could be also things that are discussed at conferences um, that you have internal to your institution where you don't wanna have just your microbiologist talking to your microbiologist and your pharmacist talking to your pharmacist. You wanna be talking to each other. And in, in my mind, sometimes there are no-brainer technologies. Let me give you an example of that. Multitaf mass spectrometry is a no-brainer technology, okay? It's better, faster, cheaper. It, when I saw it the first time, this is back in 2009, I almost couldn't believe what it could do. But I thought, well, if that's true, this is just going to replace everything we do. And we don't, we don't need anyone else to weigh in. We just do it because it's so obvious. But uh, you know what, what comes down, I think, on some of these newer diagnostics is two things. One is cost. So some of them are quite costly. And I know there are lots of reimbursement questions in the chat and that ties into cost as well, although reimbursement is a different question uh, than, than cost. And then I would say there are accuracy questions. Like I was talking about with the meningitis encephalitis panel. I am a big fan of molecular diagnostics and also sequencing based diagnostics. I see things in the chat about that. But I also want to make sure what we do is safe for our patients, right? If we're going to introduce a snazzy new thing that's all shiny and super fast, I just want to make sure it's not going to cause any harm. Either keep it even or help us in some way as, as we do this. And, and so, you know, that has to be understood as well. I'm not saying that, that diagnostics are harmful. We, we just want to understand, you know, what, what we're getting into here. And some of that it needs to be done by the clinical microbiology people. I mean, you don't want to know everything that we do, just like we probably don't want to know everything that you do, but you want to have those conversations at the right time. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. And yes, we do have quite a bit of questions around um, just the cost and the economics behind it and reimbursement and things like that. So <clears throat> that's, that's a bit of an external question as it is internally proving value. Um, I know Dr. Patel, there's a question here that just is, is more of a, a maybe decision-making from the, from the laboratory, but has clinical implications is the, the, that I'd like you to answer relates to the blood sample. And there was a question about adding it directly into the rapid diagnostic test versus waiting for um, whether it was growing or an identifier of it on the gram stain and things like that. Do you, do you wanna answer that question? Absolutely. So I think um, I, I saw it too when I looked at my slides and Brandon's slides. It's yeah. it's really you know we we are starting blood culture diagnostic improvement at the time you have something growing in your blood culture bottle. I and and sometimes you can count back to when the blood culture was collected, but you're never going to improve 
that time in the blood culture bottle, unless we get better blood culture systems. And by the way, Biomaria and BD, our technology is now from the 1990s there. I think there are improvements to be made there. That's just my shout out to you. But, <laughs> but fundamentally, I know what everybody wants, right? You, you want to just collect the blood and test it. You don't want to collect it, put it on the instrument, wait for the instrument to flag positive, and then run the rapid diagnostic. That there's something not quite right about that. So what I can tell you is that there are technologies that are emerging uh, that are, I think, in the future going to enable that. It's always a challenge, right? The reason why at my institution, when we do blood cultures, it's 60 cc's of blood for every patient having blood cultures. And I don't want to get into all the details behind that. But, you know, it's hard to recapitulate that with a, a small volume and a molecular diagnostic test. So really looking for the needle in the haystack um, and, and finding not just the organism, but remember that from blood cultures, we also need some sort of susceptibility information usually. Um, you, I see a number of companies working on that. I'm the director of the Laboratory Center for the NIH's Antibacterial Resistance Leadership Group, or ARLG. And uh, we, we are looking at setting a study to look at some of these novel diagnostics direct from blood. But to answer your question specifically, what about the biofire, these other blood culture-based diagnostics? Can't, why can't you do them right on blood? Well, you can't do that because they're not configured to have the sensitivity that they need to give you a result off of blood. So don't do that. You'll actually get negative results. And that's, that's a good thing because when they're used on positive blood culture bottles, those are chock full, 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6, 10 to the 8 CFU per ml of organism. And their LOD is way up high. So you can't possibly just take that test and use it direct on blood. But I would say, um, hopefully, optimistically, coming soon. And I saw a comment about the carious test. So that's an example of a test like that, right? I wouldn't say that it's particularly rapid, but it is showing us the possibility of what could be done. And I think this is you know, a field where both Brandon and I have talked about changing technologies in the past, well, I guess decade and a half, if I, maybe is about right. Well, we're going to be living through this at least for another decade, and who knows what happens after that, maybe more, right? So I think another message is that, you know, we're on a rapidly moving train here, and uh, just stay on the train and pay attention to what's going on, because I think you will get your direct from blood diagnostics. Remember, I, I should, I'm remiss to tell you, we do have one. Uh, T2 candida and T2 bacteria is one that's directly from blood. Um, T2 bacteria is limited to, I believe, five different species. So, you know, it, it's good and it shows what's possible, but it's not comprehensive and it doesn't give you any resistance information. So I think, you know, over time that we'll see this built out and then we'll have to figure out the same questions. How to use this in clinical practice? When should they be ordered? How should we act on them and so forth? So that's where we have a lot of fun ahead of us. Morning. Thank can you. I add, can I add yeah, something? please. Um, you know, it, it made me think of two things. One, um, the, the BCID results, for example, with Canada species, you know, we, um, we, we're doing a multi-center study right now on how folks are handling discordance between that. So the BCID, the, you know, will show Canada and then no Canada grows ultimately. And so is it a, because you have great sensitivity and you're picking it up with this technology or not, you know, and so we're looking at that right now in a multi-center study and it's, it's fascinating because one thing we have found, and this is where you, it's really neat to collaborate with other institutions and, and, and I don't want to misquote exactly what the, the PI, the package says for the materials, but if it doesn't grow on gram stain, like if yeast isn't seen on gram stain, then some institutions don't report the Canada result for the BCID. It's just left off. Whereas other institutions feel, no, if it was there, we want to make sure it's reported and then let the clinician make a decision based on the patient's you know, risk assessment. So we have found variability in how reporting is done among institutions around. And so that's just another little nuance to rapid diagnostics too, is the output getting to the clinician can actually be different, even if the technology is the same. And uh, Carious is certainly interesting. We, it's certainly, I wouldn't consider it rapid yet either. We, you know, we get our results back in a couple of days, you know, however long the mail takes, but um, that, uh, that's something we're using as well um, in our institution. How, how are you using it, Brandon? For the Carious, so most of the time we're studying whether it's clinically impactful right now to let you know. Yeah. 
but most of the time what we're doing is in patients that have a culture negative diagnosis, uh, usually uh, of serious invasive nature or prolonged. Um, yeah. and, and we've had some incredible anecdotal experiences, you know, uncovering Legionella that was missed on a urinary antigen and um, patient rapidly responds to quinolone. And it, it helps you from just throwing darts with different antibiotics in those patients. You know, it does help you in those those nuanced cases, but it'll be interesting to see where we're, we're uh, interested in what the results of our local study will show. Excellent. Yeah. We don't have much time left, so I'm going to have to ask you. I'm just posting the attendance code. Um, so the actual code, uh, I, it looks a bit uh, misconstrued on the chat box, but the code itself is GYKVP7. And then, um, Brandon, if you'll go ahead and just get, pull that last slide back up for us. That's the code you need to obtain your, your CE. Um, my final question is uh, to both of you is obviously, oh, the, the, the CE website is there on the slide now. Someone just asked the question. It's at proce.com. And we will be sending an email out to all of our participants today so that you'll have this information as well as an email along with a link to this recorded presentation. But, uh, and thank you so much for everyone that could attend. My final question to each of you is, as you work through um, the, the rollout of a rapid, making the decision-making, validation in the laboratory, and then rolling out and collecting these metrics, there is a reporting process when you communicate back up to administration, um, or we would call it the C-suite. Um, and Brandon, I was curious, how do you handle, uh, if you're tracking de-escalation, and all these other metrics, but there are obviously, as Dr. Patel mentioned, there's times when there's escalation. And how do you frame that conversation? Uh, it, it's a good point. Uh, very early on, uh, this is probably 12 or 13 years ago, when we had a conversation about growing our stewardship program, we were quickly told that it's not all about the metrics, that you need to show us some quality as well. And so we actually include quality anecdotal experiences of individual patients whenever we present so that uh, folks get a, uh, a patient experience. That's part of our mission and vision of the hospital, you know, is a patient experience. And so we also walk them through that. But, you know, uh, quickly our mechanisms, I mean, our committee full, full group meeting once a month will have quality and other folks that are there to hear the message. So they understand the value and they're hearing it directly from us. Uh, we do a state of the stewardship presentation once a year at Grand Rounds uh, that is attended by a lot of folks. And uh, we theme it, make it fun every year and, and give them a year uh, recount of what all we did um, and how it impacted their patients. And that's kind of the message, too, is it's their patients. You know, it's not it's not ours. It's not, you know, someone's it's it's everyone's. And so um, th through those mechanisms, I think we're able to convey the message pretty consistently, but there are always going to be things that come up that they, you know, need to trump what we're doing, so to speak. And, and that's why we try to align what we do with the quality initiatives and the vision and mission of the department or hospital so that we're not spinning our wheels. Great. Um, and Dr. Patel, uh, the, the final question to you, um, you mentioned a little bit about the future and, and where, and where you see the uh, diagnostics going. Um, I'm wondering if you could just provide some, you know, with your, with what you're foreseeing and some of the diagnostics you're testing, what are some of the, the key areas for people to pay attention? And then what would be maybe the, the, the metrics or the considerations on the clinical side for these that you might need to have infrastructure around, or uh, I think, you know what I'm saying? Like, those key things that are important to, to have as you would roll those types of technologies out. Right, uh, thanks for the, the question. You know, um, I would say we're all in this together. You know, one of the things that we've learned from the panel tests is sometimes you're missing something you'd love to have on the panel. And sometimes you have things on the panel that you quite frankly care not to have on the panel. Um, I think you all can think about examples of that and your, I, I see Brandon smiling so I know he's thinking about that and you know when companies are coming up with these remarkable technological tests they they often put together panels of experts to figure out what needs to be on that panel 
um, or how they need to build their tests. And that's how this all happens. But in fact, we're really not able to show what needs to be there and the value of it until we have the test. And so I think this really needs to be a very iterative process. And I, it ties into reimbursement as well, right? Because in the end, um, I, I believe a lot of this technology is just where we should be in 2021. I mean, to, to even talk about going back to culture for some of these things just blows my mind. I hope we're not doing that in 2030. Um, I don't, I'm not saying all new technology is good, but a lot of new technology is good. Look, we're on Zoom today with 500 and something participants who, who knew this was gonna be going on, right? I'll tech, I'm a believer in technology, but I think it's up to all of us. It's not just up to, to the people creating the technology, it's really up to the people using the technology to figure out what's going to be better and to work iteratively together. Um, so I would say, you know, learn about what's possible communicate what you guys think is needed and wanted to the field, because then companies will deliver what you want to you. Don't wait for someone to tell you what you need. That doesn't make any sense. We need to be all in this together. That's a perfect conclusion. With that, we're completely out of time. So I'm gonna close the webinar and thank our two speakers for staying on. And for we had so many questions here. Uh, part three of this, we will be addressing more of these questions. We're going to come back for a roundtable discussion in a few months. Uh, so stay tuned for that date so we can get at some deeper and in, dive into some of these questions. Wanted to uh, just make sure everyone's aware of the attendance code that's on your screen there. Um, and so thank Dr. Patel and Dr. Bookstaver for all the time they've put into this presentation and providing the information to us. Our SIDP uh, program planning partners, uh, Bruce Jones, Vasilios Athens, and Kelly Echevarria, uh, Pro-CE Richard Lewis, and Chris Smelzer, um, and, our, and our sponsor, BioMario, and production team at SIDRAP, Maya Peters, and Dr. Chris Moore. Appreciate you all. This has been recorded, so you can visit SIDRAP website uh, to view it again or share it with your colleagues. And have a good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye.